The date is December 3. This is the Thursday edition of the news on PBCJ. I'm Simone Absalom. Some Jamaican residents could be without water this Christmas. This as the National Water Commission, NWC, is enforcing a disconnection drive to collect outstanding payments from customers. Public Relations Manager at NWC, Andrew Cannon, says the move follows NWC's COVID assistance program, where delinquent customers were encouraged to settle their arrears. The NWC is now facing certain financial obligations that must be addressed. In light of that, it is very important that customers who have outstanding balances to pay up their bills. Those who do not pay their bills, they could face disconnection. In fact, we are now going to go on a massive disconnection drive in a bid to get all outstanding revenue. Customers are being reminded that non-payment of their bills could affect their credit ratings. They're also being reminded to monitor their consumption patterns, especially during this Christmas period. Police Commissioner Major General Anthony Anderson has commissioned a special task force to counter criminals throughout the Christmas season. He gave the details during a virtual press brief on Wednesday. Melvin Pennant tells us more. Police Commissioner Major General Anthony Anderson says the JCF is aware of concerns relating to robberies and a special task force has been established to combat the threat. In response to these and this, this threat, we have special anti-robbery initiatives focusing on the shopping and other commercial areas, including markets, and these are underway. Additionally, overt and covert teams across the divisions will be targeting these motorcyclists as well as persons, other persons seeking to carry out the robberies. He says JCF will be increasing its anti-gang operations and clamping down on all illegal gatherings. What the public may not appreciate, and I think it's important that I bring this to, to person's attention, is that under normal application for events under the Noise Abatement Act, it allows police officers to be aware uh, and do background checks on the promoters of these events and also on the venues. And so once approved, the police are able to monitor the event. These illegal gatherings have no such advance notice and therefore are inherently more dangerous. And this is an area that the public can assist greatly in by advising us through 119 that an event is happening. We also urge persons not to attend such gatherings. The police commissioner also gave an update on crime statistics as at November 30. In the area of murder, we are uh, 25 or 2 percent below last year. In terms of shootings, we are 16, or shooting incidents, we are 16 uh, up from last year. That's a 1.4 percent increase. On rape, we are down 79 cases or 15.5 percent for robbery. We are down 199 cases, or 17.7 percent, and for break-ins, we're down 208, or 18 percent. Melvin Pennant, PBCJ News. A national COVID-19 vaccine coordinating committee is being established to manage the distribution of COVID-19 vaccines and monitoring their effects on the population. Health Minister Dr. Christopher Tufton told members of Parliament on Tuesday that the committee will comprise public and private sector experts. Vaccination has proved, Madam Speaker, an undeniable success in the public health toolkit to reduce the burden of infectious disease. And already, the Ministry of Health and Wellness has in draft a plan to manage the introduction of the vaccine to the country. So we are already putting a plan in place and will therefore work with that committee to outline, to fine tune that plan and to accompany that plan with a public education program. At least three COVID-19 vaccines are set to be completed by early next year. The World Health Organization has advised that strategies must be put in place to manage effective procurement and distributions of the vaccine. We are making progress, I think, as a world, uh, and that's the silver lining, if you will, the glimmer of hope. 
um, around finding a vaccine for COVID-19. In fact, there, are, there is word that as early as this month, uh, there are some jurisdictions that are likely to have emergency approval for trial of certain vaccines. And that augurs well for the response to COVID to finally overcome the, the, the main threat that it represents without a vaccine. But we do believe, and this is based on our expert advice coming out of PAHO WHO, that by the end of the first quarter of next year, March, we should see approved vaccines being distributed and certainly going into the summer months of next year there should be mass distribution. Jamaica has signed on to the COVAX facility and have made payments through funding from the European Union grant. The facility was convened to ensure quality and equitable access to COVID-19 vaccines. The U.S. Centers for Disease Control and Prevention has recommended that healthcare workers be first in line for the vaccines. As we continue to monitor the COVID-19 impact on the island, here are the latest clinical summary from the Health Ministry. A 67-year-old male from St. Catherine is the 259th victim of COVID-19 on the island. Over the past 24 hours, 47 new cases of the virus were also detected. This pushes the total to 10,911, of which 3,888 are active. 114 recoveries were also recorded, with that tally now rising to 6,614. 73 persons are hospitalized, 21 are moderately ill, and 10 are critical. For the news on PBCJ, I'm Gabrielle Thompson. Newly minted opposition leader, the People's National Party's Mark Golding, has named members of his shadow cabinet. Mr. Golding will be monitoring the defense portfolio. The 19-member strong shadow cabinet also includes Julian Robinson, opposition spokesperson for finance planning and the public service portfolio. Senator Lambert Brown, opposition spokesperson for public service. Lisa Hanna will shadow foreign affairs and foreign trade. Senator Peter Bunting has been named leader of opposition business in the Senate. He will shadow the national security portfolio. Anthony Hilton, leader of opposition business in the House. He will be opposition spokesperson for industry investment and global logistics. Dr. Angela Brown Burke, Deputy Leader of Opposition Business in the House and Opposition Spokesperson for Education and Training. Senator Donna Scott Muthley, Deputy Leader of Opposition Business in the Senate and Opposition Spokesperson for Justice and Gender Affairs. Senator Janice Allen will shadow the Tourism Ministry. Dr. Morris Guy, the Ministry of Health and Wellness. Senator Damian Crawford, Culture and Entertainment, Mikhail Phillips, Housing, Transport and Works, Lothian Cousins, Water and Agriculture, Denise Daly, Local Government and Community Development, Senator Sophia Fraser Binns will shadow Land Environment and Climate Change, Hugh Graham, Commerce, Science and Technology, Philip Paulwell, Mining and Energy, Senator Dr. Floyd Morris, will shadow labor, social security, and special abilities. And Senator Gabriella Morris will shadow youth and sports. Visually impaired student Jasmine Dean was last seen on February 27. The police have held a person of interest in their probe, but to date, no major breakthroughs. Her family and friends have made public appeals for information about her whereabouts, but to no avail. Police Commissioner Major General Anthony Anderson gave an update on the case at a JCF virtual press conference on Wednesday. To this point, we have not found her. We have used uh, significant police assets to try and locate her. We have persons in custody uh, for being associated with the crimes relating to Jasmine Dean. Particularly, we have found persons who had belongings of hers, etc. We do not have a, um, we have not found her, whether alive or dead, up to this point. 
And um, although those people have been charged, and I think they've been convicted, of the, right, uh, so they're in custody. Uh, it will take a year, um, or just over a year, for us to actually apply additional charges, like the charge of murder, to, to these, um, these persons. There are 18 restorative centers across the island, and they have so far returned a 90% success rate. Justice Minister Delroy Chuck says alternative dispute resolutions are crucial to easing the backlog in our courts. He was speaking at a virtual town hall on Wednesday. Just recently, we decided that we would open two restorative justice centers in West Kingston. Let me tell you, they have been major success stories. And I want to say, one of the leading light of West Kingston, a lady known as Daphne Hurge, she participated, and unfortunately, because of age, ill health, she called me just two days ago to say she has to discontinue. But she said, Mr. Chop, this program of restorative justice is the best program she has ever participated in. And when you look at the success story just this year, I got the figures for just this year. Denham Town had 81 conferences, restorative justice conferences, and there was a peaceful settlement in 73 of them. Tivoli Gardens had conferences in 123 cases, and there were peaceful settlements in 112 cases. Alternative Dispute Resolution is a private voluntary foundation established in July 1994 to establish and encourage the use of alternative dispute resolution techniques throughout Jamaica. Motorists will have to pay more for gas and diesel prices this week. Gabriel Thompson has this and other market details in this edition of the Business Report. According to the latest ex-refinery costs from Petrojam, motorists should see an increase at the pumps in the prices of gasoline and diesel, effective Thursday, December 3. 87 and 90 octane gasoline will be sold for $108.07 and $110.90 per litre, respectively up by $1.50 each. Following an increase of $1.78, Automotive diesel fuel will be sold for $112.74 per litre, while ultra-low sulfur diesel is up by $2.21 and will be sold for $115.69 per litre. Meanwhile, kerosene increased in price by $2.21 and will be sold for $87.34 per litre. Propane liquid petroleum will be sold for $46.73 per litre, up by $1.52, and butane liquid petroleum will be sold for $52.60 per litre after an increase of 50 cents. Marketing companies and retailers will add their respective markup to these prices. In Wednesday's trading session, the JSE combined index declined by 1,091 points to close at under 400,000 units. Overall market activity resulted from trading in 79 stocks, of which 37 advanced, 33 declined, and 9 traded firm. The junior market index declined by 16 points to close at under 3,000 units. Stocks advanced for 1834 Investments Limited, Access Financial Services, and AMG Packaging and Paper Company. Stocks declined for 138 Student Living Jamaica Limited, Barita Investments, and Caribbean Cement Company. Trading firm were CAC 2000 9.5% preference shares, Elite Diagnostic Limited, and Epley Limited 5% preference shares. Wigton Wind Farm Limited Ordinary Shares was the volume leader with 2.9 million units, followed by Trans Jamaican Highway Limited with 1.8 million units and Jamaican Tees Limited with just over 2.4 million units. Now for the foreign exchange. The US dollar on Wednesday, December 2 ended trading at $145.96. The Canadian dollar sold for an average $112.95. 
the pound sterling traded for $194.15 and the euro ended trading at $179.70. Oil prices fell on Thursday as producers including Saudi Arabia and Russia locked horns over the need to extend record production cuts set in place during the first wave of the COVID-19 pandemic. Brent crude futures fell 26 cents to settle at $47.99 a barrel. West Texas intermediate crude futures slipped 29 cents to $44.99 a barrel. And that does it for this edition of the Business Report on PBCJ. I'm Gabrielle Thompson. If you feel for a savory meal where you have the power to decide your toppings, we have the mix for you. This week's culinary trail leads us to Pizza Land. Pizza Land has been in Jamaica for a number of years. Originally owned by Italians, um, they decided to go back, unfortunately. So we saw the opportunity to take it up and make a purchase. I'm the manager over here. The general manager is Mr. Craig Bromfield. He's a Jamaican native, but he lives in the UK. We're keeping everything the same for now. Of course, we may integrate it with some Jamaican things, but for the pasta and the pizzas, there will be no change. So everything remains the same. We want to maintain an authentic Italian feel, which is why before they left, they trained my staff um, to ensure that we keep that same feel. So Jamaicans are used to food a certain type of way. Italians are basically everything fresh, herbs and spices. So we want to keep that feel here. And this is why we don't want to change anything. We have from pizzas, pastas, uh, salads, sandwiches. We have breadsticks. Uh, we have gluten-free pasta, which is one of our best sellers. Okay, our gluten-free offering right now is just pasta. So gluten-free is, uh, f well, basically flour free from wheat and grains. So for persons who may have certain kind of illnesses, they can't digest gluten-free, so we offer that option. There are other things that you offer, including sandwiches. Yes. We have sandwiches, uh, we also have vegetarian sandwiches as well, so no meat, no cheese. Um, we do carry uh, dairy-free um, cheese, but we're out of stock right now. So once you enter our store, you're greeted and you go straight to our sanitizing station. Um, we are going to be mounting one on the wall, which would be a little bit easier, but we usually don't have a large crowd in here. Customers can call in their orders. We also are working on some delivery options. Our first one is Peckish, which we're now online with, so they can order there if they don't wish to come in. If they are outside for any reason and there's too much going on in the car park, they can call in and we can do a curbside delivery. Build our own pizza. We have a basic cheese pizza. We have two sizes. We have nine inch and 12 inch for all our pizzas. They're all cut in eight slices. Um, so, or pizzas we have from meat, vegetarian, uh, and seafood. We also have two specialty pizzas that we do with barbecue sauce and Alfredo sauce instead of the regular marinara tomato sauce.
We are located in Ligani Plaza, and of course we're looking to expand into other parishes. Pizza Land is an experience. You can't find Italy in Jamaica, and this is where you can get a piece of that. days of record low numbers in the Bahamas, a top health official is warning Bahamians not to let their guard down. Gillian Gray reports. The single-digit positive COVID numbers are very promising, according to Infectious Diseases Director Dr. Nakia Forbes. She warned, though, that Bahamians must be responsible as this drastic decrease can be reversed if people become too lax. Lab reported and confirmed numbers are always lower than the number of cases in country. So that means that there are still people with COVID-19 that have mild symptoms that didn't go in to get a test or that there could be asymptomatic people. And so that should mean that there are still cases of COVID-19 in the community and there could even be clusters. And all that would be required for it to be transmitted in cases to go up again is not to follow the public health guidance and to have parties. And that's going to cause a spike in cases. Forbes said the decrease in confirmed and hospitalized cases as well as deaths shows that the curve is flattening. In total, there were 806 new cases of COVID-19 reported in November, a stark drop from the 2,612 cases reported in October. Public health measures should be followed well into next year, though, as Forbes says things won't be normal until people are vaccinated. The horizon looks better in terms of vaccines becoming available. So that is a good thing, and we're optimistic that things could be better in the future with COVID-19. But the most important thing is until we're at a point where most persons are vaccinated, that's how, how we get populations immune, we're still going to have to be following these public health measures for some time into next year. Well, many residents are breathing a sigh of relief as they say the low COVID-19 numbers not only makes them feel safer, but also more hopeful for the future. As long as the countries that surround us are, are responding in a positive mindset as relates to the COVID, I think we, we should be in a good space uh, come 2021. I think it's a wonderful thing that it, that it dropped. COVID, get out! You're not welcome! <laughs> Reporting for our news, I'm Jillian Gray. Finance Minister Colm Imbert says administering swift justice in Trinidad and Tobago is a problem when it comes to prosecuting the corrupt. Minister Imbert was a member of a panel discussion hosted by CAF Development Bank of Latin America entitled Integrity in Public Life, Keys to Prevent Corruption. Tyrone Brown-Campbell has the details. Minister of Finance Colm Imbert said United States citizens convicted of fraud in the Piaco Airport corruption case have served their sentences. This is in comparison to locals accused of fraud in the same case who are still waiting to be tried 18 years later. Minister Imbert pointed to this as an issue in our local judicial system. It's our constitution. I can't say whether it's the same for other countries in the Caribbean and in Latin America. I, I haven't studied that sufficiently. But our constitution makes it very, very difficult for us to prosecute people. Our problem is very complicated. We have the laws, but our judicial system and our constitution makes it very difficult for us to progress these things quickly. During the discussions, Minister Imber also highlighted some of the facilities that members of the public will be able to access online once government goes fully digital. The way we intend to use technology is for e-procurement, so that a lot of our procurement will be online and available for everybody to see. They can see with their own eyes what's happening. And uh, whistleblowing, we uh -huh. will be moving towards that. Uh, digital whistleblowing, with some level of encryption, I'm sure, to uh, allow anonymous whistleblowing. And also freedom of information. 
Barbados Minister of Economic Affairs and Investment, Marsha Cattle, was the other panelist during Wednesday's discussion on corruption. Minister Cattle said Barbados recently put laws in place to address corruption, and she was adamant that some issues were more important than others. A big part of the reason that we cannot allow um, the integrity agenda to fall away, even in the context of COVID, is that it is key to making sure that that trust remains throughout everything that, that, that you do, because you cannot do anything um, without, without that. One of the key findings that influenced CAF, Development Bank of Latin America, to host the discussion was regional research that indicated that 51% of the region's population, Latin America and the Caribbean, consider corruption to be a major issue. Terry Ann Brown Campbell, TTT News. In sports, we take to the pitch with cricket. Number eight ranked West Indies face number two New Zealand in two test matches, the first of which starts on Wednesday evening in Hamilton. Given the West Indies poor performances on the previous tour, Captain Jason Holder wants the series to be the opposite. We get more in the support. New Zealand has been a solid fortress. West Indies has not won a test series or a test match since 1995 in New Zealand. Their best result since has been a drawn series where they drew both of the matches on the 2009 tour, while on the last tour in 2017, they lost both tests. New Zealand have not lost at home since South Africa defeated them, one nil in a three tests on the 2016 tour. They have gone on to host West Indies, England, Sri Lanka, Bangladesh, and of recent India, all of whom they have won series. Test captain Jason Holder, speaking on the eve of the contest, indicated the team is building in the right direction and want to make amends for the past failures against the Black Caps. Yeah, I think we're in with a really good chance. Um, you know, cricket is played on a day. We've really beaten a lot of top sides in the last couple of years as well too. And I think this side has been building, um, heading in the right direction. So for me, this tour is really important. Um, the last time we came here, uh, I think we were pretty much outplayed. But it's pretty much the same guys that we've we've had, you know, for the last couple of years. So a lot of these guys are familiar with the conditions now, and would like to like to make amends for the last time's performance. So more or less, I think we stand a really good chance, but we just need to be disciplined and execute our plans. The Caribbean side should enter this first test confident from the two practice matches, as they both occupied the crease and some batsmen went on to score hundreds. Opener Craig Bradford made his highest first class score, 246 against New Zealand A. On the last tour, Bratwit was West Indies' highest runs getter, scoring 201 runs from four innings at an average of just over 50 and had a highest score of 9 to 1. Darren Bravo, who highest test score of 218, came on a 2013 tour to New Zealand, got one century and fell seven short in a warm-up match. And that's our packet. Join us same time, same place for the news right here on PBCJ.